Hello and welcome to TVS Dialogue, the show where we talk about uh, the current trends, uh, the hottest issues and the latest topics with industry leaders um, and industry players and also prominent people. I am Razi Ahmad. And I am Charles Mato. And we have a special topic for you today, a topic that I'm sure is close to the hearts of all coffee lovers, as well as myself and everyone out there. And that is everyone's favourite coffee place, which is Starbucks. Starbucks. We are here at the Starbucks drive-thru. It has just opened this year in Kuching. And who better to talk about Starbucks than the Starbucks Malaysia bigwig himself, Dato Sidney Lawrence Keys, the group CEO of Berjaya Food Berhad and managing director of Starbucks Malaysia. Dato, welcome. Hi. Hi. Welcome to TVN Dialog and uh, thank you for uh, having us here. Oh, thank you for having me on your, mm. on your show. And uh, Cheryl, Berjaya Food Berhad uh, is not only uh, has not only Starbucks, but it also has franchises. Yes, Razi. Yeah. And uh, I think Bijaya Food Berhad has its businesses. I mean, not only Starbucks, but also Kenny Rogers, yes. Jollibean, Krispy yes. Kreme, Donuts, yes. Calava, yes. and Paris Baguette, yes. right? Yes. And also, um, congratulations on this establishment. And um, we're actually here to talk about, right, Razi, is uh, Starbucks. As we know, Starbucks is a place uh, wherever we go or whenever Malaysians go, they know that that is Starbucks, definitely. And everywhere you go, there is a Starbucks logo. I everywhere. Think. Yeah. yeah, Starbucks <laughs> has, has a fleet of about 379 stores nationwide across all states and territories. Uh, we've plans to open up uh, more than 35 to 40 uh, new stores uh, in the financial year 2023. And of the total, over 70 are drive through stores. So it has been a tremendously successful venture uh, for Berjaya Food uh, Berhad. Yeah, and yeah. also that uh, Starbucks Malaysia just inaugurated its first signing store in Borneo, located right. in right. Viva City, Mega Mall, right. Kuching, right? Its soft launching just occurred, right. I think, yeah, uh, earlier. And this store marks a significant milestone in the market as the third signing store in Malaysia. Right. And also uh, after Kuala Lumpur and Penang, right. being the 20th establishment, uh, of uh, the Starbucks store worldwide as part of its deaf community store right. program. Now, the store, I'm pretty sure, aims to uplift the local community by fostering inclusivity as well as, I think, celebrating the vibrant culture of the deaf and hard of hearing people. Right. And, and interesting, uh, Cheryl, the signing store had had its soft opening on July 27th, actually. And so far, customer feedback has been uh, very positive, Dato as this highlights Starbucks uh, being the only coffee chain in Malaysia to establish a community store dedicated to supporting the deaf community through its partnership with the Sarawak Society for the Deaf, SSD. Uh, Dato, since we are on the topic of the signing store, what are some key initiatives under Starbucks signing store program and how do these uh, initiatives exemplify uh, the company's commitment to inclusivity and community engagement? Dato. I think the first thing that I would like to say is that we'll be opening our 400th Starbucks store uh, next month. Yeah, and that will be in Penang. So we are 400 uh, store. Uh, and I say that is because it's a significant milestone for us. Um, and that also marks our 25th year anniversary in Malaysia. And uh, this signing store, which is the third in, uh, in uh, Malaysia, um, it's a labor of love for us over the last six years that we started this uh, program. Um, and uh, yeah, the thing about the signing store is that when we started this program, to be able to provide a place for the deaf community to grow their, to be able to grow themselves, to be independent, to be able to uh, uh, progress, to be able to grow as an uh, as individual. And that's why we started this program. One of the key uh, factors of this program was the fact that a lot of people uh, do employ the deaf community but to do a lot of menial work. Uh, the goal at that time, uh, for me especially, was to be able to give them the opportunity to, to become leaders, to be able to progress in, in, uh, in society. So that was basically the plan. Um, we were the first country in the world to do this. The first when we opened in uh, KL, we were the first country in the world to do this. And uh, subsequently, we opened in Penang. So in Kuching, it, it, it marks a milestone uh, because it's far away from Penang and K. 
KL, right? Yeah. yeah. So, but when we came and uh, and we spoke to the to the Deaf Society here, you know, and we found that they were so passionate about what they they were doing, and that's one of the reasons why it made us uh, decide to have our third store here. So it's not so much on uh, on the CSR front. For us, it's providing that job opportunity for the deaf community. And we learned so much when we embarked on this, this program. And one of the things that we learned is that um, you know, providing the self-confidence and, um, and, um, and being able to, uh, to feel that you are valued. These are all basic human needs. And a lot of times, people who are, who are underprivileged to a certain degree, they lose that. So our goal really is to build that for them. You know, and when they join us, we, we also have the first deaf shift manager in the world. Somebody running a store who is deaf. And that is in, uh, that is in KL and Penang as well. And we hope to replicate that here also. You know, so again, um, I think this has been a, a labor of love for us over the last six years. And um, it's the goal eventually is for us to be able to have a signing store in every single state in Malaysia. And uh, so, so uh, literally, Kuching is a part of that journey for us as we go along. Yeah. So that's a very commendable uh, effort yeah. on the part of Starbucks Herald. Yes, and thank you for making Kuching part of your labor of love <laughs> as well. Oh, it was, it was our pleasure, yeah. yeah. I see. And maybe, uh, maybe you could share also a little bit on um, having Kuching as his first signing store. I mean, would they be pioneering or uh, those who are trained? Uh, maybe you can briefly a bit more about the trainers there. Are they going to pioneer and train other signing stores? or? So I'll, I'll break that down into two parts, right? So the first thing is, let's talk about customers. <clears throat> so in, in uh, the traditional way that you would order when you come to a Starbucks store, is that you walk in, you place your order, you look at the menu board, place your order, right? So for the signing store, it will be a little bit different. Uh, you will have to write your order. But what we have done is this. You will only write your order once. Maximum twice when you come into our store. By the third time you walk into the store, you will already know how to sign your drink. Because our baristas will teach you how to do that. So you will learn how to sign your drink. So you will know what your favourite drink is and you will know how to sign it. So it's the first part of that whole education process. Right, that is literally for that is literally for our customers. And then secondly is that we also provide uh, classes for our customers to learn how to sign. And that will be that we have done that in Kia, we've done that in Penang as well. So we provide classes for them to uh, on weekends they can actually sign up, and then learn how to sign. And it's not related to Starbucks. It's about signing in general. You know, so you learn how to say thank you. You learn how to. To, to, uh, to be able to communicate on a brief manner with anybody who's there. So mm. that, be, that makes it a lot more inclusive, makes society a lot so more So it's not just inclusive. about star ordering for Starbucks, it's about spreading awareness on the sign language for that society. Is literally yeah. the whole, that is literally mm. the whole idea. And we have communicated this from day one. That is the whole idea. The whole idea is to be able to build the awareness for the deaf community. It's never seen <laughs> as a business for us. And the reason why I say that is because, I, as I've mentioned, right, I've got 400 store opening soon, the 400. And uh, I have three signing stores. This is my third, three signing stores, right? So it's never a business for us. I've got 397 stores to do business in. So this is not literally taken as a business for us. This is mainly to be able to, to uh, build that bridge between the deaf and the hearing community and that has always been literally our, literally our goal. I, th yeah. I think building the bridge is something that uh, most most of us uh, should be aware of and I think um, we are coming towards September which is the Deaf Awareness Month yeah. as well and I think it's just the right timing right. as your signing store has just launched and also earlier Dato, you mentioned also on the um, CSRs so we can see that Starbucks is at the forefront of demonstrating the sustainability theme and I think this can be seen with its CSR programs in the country I mean if we touch and go further down on the CSR programs it's received numerous awards as well as accolades for pioneering the environment social and governance ESG initiatives in FNB so for that Dato maybe you can provide uh, 
examples to share with us on Starbucks and Bajaya Foods joint corporate social responsibility undertakings as a collaboration in aligning perhaps their respective corporate um, service mm -hmm. responsibilities, which can contribute also to broader societal abilities. The, the, uh, the first thing is that uh, Bajaya Food, we just recently received a four-star ESG rating as a listed company. And you would know that is very that is very significant for any listed company. So we are we are rated four stars. Um, so the initiatives that we have are uh, actually we have many initiatives in all all across our brands. Um, in total, in retail, uh, we have close to about um, six hundred different locations. If you look at the multiple brands that we have, um, we employ close to about eight thousand people in the group in the group so you know in, in uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for us to do do good you know um, so some of the initiatives that for Starbucks especially obviously the signing store is is, is really our, uh, something that we are so proud about um, we also have uh, the environmental projects that we do now, some of the environmental projects for example uh, recycling or upcycling I will use coffee bags into pouches that we sell in our stores yeah. so if you if you come to any Starbucks, you will see that there's a pouch that you can buy, and that's from a recycled uh, coffee bag. And the proceeds from that go back to the people who actually sold the bags. And this is the B40 community of Malaysia. So we work with uh, an NGO that uh, does this, supports us, and does this for us. So that's one. We are also um, uh, environmentally conscious. If you see in some of our stores, we use uh, solar panels. You know, and uh, also we use uh, recycled water. You know, we also um, in uh, this is in uh, in uh, uh, Smnanjo. We have uh, we have uh, drive throughs that have uh, EV chargers, so customers can actually charge their car while they have coffee. So the the initiatives are, are many. We also have uh, individual outlets that do their own initiatives. For their own communities for example say if you are in a beach community uh, in a beach area say for example like the nang uh, we have the local stores that actually work with our customers who want to sign up and we do things like beach cleanup yeah so there are many initiatives that go on at any one time in starbucks you know and as you mentioned the death awareness month next month we are also very excited and, and also the thing is that this store that we have opened here it also marks our 25th anniversary as a company. So this store is extremely significant for us because it is part of that whole 25th anniversary uh, celebration that we're having. So Starbucks is 25 years in Malaysia this year. You know, so that really is something really significant for, for our Kuching right. yeah, store. It's Silver Jubilee. Yeah, That's yes. It. Silver Jubilee, yeah. <laughs> yes. So Dato, yes. since you are speaking on the initiatives that are being undertaken by uh, Starbucks uh, for the broader societal benefit. I would like to touch on uh, the core cultural values that Starbucks has in its company. So what are the co core cultural values that Starbucks promotes within its organization and how do these values influence the company's day-to-day -day operations and decision-making processes? The first thing I would want to say is that um, we call everybody that works for Starbucks partners. So we do not uh, define them as employees uh, or staff. They are all partners, and the reason why is because we all work together for one goal, and that is to uh, whatever goals that are set by the business. So we are all partners, irregardless of what level you are in the organization. We are all partners. So I think that core value is very important because then everybody understands that we are all the same, literally, irregardless of what level you are. The level determines what job you do. Other than that, we are all the same, you know. So that creates that sense of belonging. So that's that number one. Um, and besides that, uh, we have a whole um, core value um, guide that everybody that comes in uh, would need to understand and learn, you know. And uh, that is practiced significantly in our in our office. We also have this thing uh, called, uh, I, and I, I take the office first, right? So we also have this thing called, uh, uh, we are very strong in culture 
and uh, a culture of uh, making everybody feel welcome in our office. So uh, we always say in, in Starbucks, right? If you join us for the first within the first week, nobody will know whether you're new or old because of the way we we embrace uh, uh, people who come in. And that to me is very important. Yes. So and that to me is very important because then it makes a person feel welcome. In them. The worst thing to do is to join an organization and be alienated for the first three months where nobody wants to talk to you. Right? So we, we practice that very strongly. And we also have a setup in our office called the Culture Club. Where new people who come in get embraced into the culture by the older people who have been in the system for, for long enough. And that same uh, culture is spread to our stores as well. You know? Because like, no matter what... Uh, there's always that segmentation in the FMB business, right? There's, there's segmentation between operation and the support team. You know? So we try to bridge that by making everybody feel welcome and knowing that everybody can count on everybody, irregardless of what position you do. So that is some of the some of the uh, ways that we really embrace the culture that we have in, in our organization. Yes, Sato. I think, uh, I mean, you have shared a lot on uh, the culture and also the sense of belonging is um, very vital for an organization, as we all know, right? And also maybe, um, Dato, we'll go for a short break uh, for sure. now, as maybe later on, we will also uh, dive deeper into more on its cultural values, its relationship with its partners as a whole, on Starbucks itself, right, sure. Jazzy? Yeah. So uh, I think for that, uh, we'll dive in more and uh, we'll be back after a short break. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back on TVS Dialogue. We're now with me, Razi Ahmad and Cheryl Shaminato. We are talking with uh, Dato Sidney Keys, the Managing Director of uh, Berjaya Food, uh, Starbucks Malaysia and the Group CEO of Berjaya Food Berhad, where we, uh, where he is here in Kuching to, to uh, inaugurate the first signing store uh, in Kuching. That's so, right. Yeah. That's right, Razi. And earlier on, in our segment earlier, right, Dato, we were uh, speaking on the culture. Interestingly, the culture of Starbucks, uh, Razi. Um, when you when you walk into a Starbucks, you know, uh, I, I mean, in my opinion, personally, you have a homely feel, uh, and it's more to like a work at home kind of space, I think. And uh, also, uh, this environment. I think, as you mentioned also earlier, is deeply affected by the cultural values that Starbucks Malaysia has brought in their organization as a whole, their employees and baristas, right, Dato? And also, uh, since we've already uh, mentioned um, on covered on those uh, those stakeholders, maybe we would also like to ask, can you provide insights on how Starbucks connects with and cultivates relationships uh, perhaps with its future partners. I mean, how does the company uh, strategically network within its stores to understand and support sectors crucial to its growth, other than the employees? I guess the the, uh, the way we look at it is that um, when we do business in any community, right, one of the first things that um, uh, we look for, especially if it's a new community, you know, and I say new community, if you take uh, maybe about five years ago, a new community may be a state that we are not in yet. But today, we're in every single state in, uh, in Malaysia. Correct. So now, the term new community has changed to be in that community, literally in that city that you do business in. So when you take it on that context, um, some of the key things that we look for, literally, is to work within that local community. And to understand what their needs are, so needs can be very simple, right? Uh, and when you talk about that kind of collaboration, it could be just as, as simple as uh, collaborating with the local residents association of that. Okay. I talk on this. I talk on the community front first, Correct. not so much on the business front. Uh, but on the community front is we collaborate with the local residents association mm -hmm. to provide a place for them to come in to have their meetings or to be able to uh, to uh, organize events in our stores. You know, so that is really getting into the core of the community, if you look at it in that way. Right? Then 
obviously there's the bigger uh, community, like the city community. And that is, Kuching is a very good example. Today, when we opened our third signing store here, we are part of that community, a part of the bigger community, the city community. You know, so that is a collaboration that we have and we work with the Society of the Deaf for, for, for uh, Sarawak. And so that now we are inclusive in that community as well. You know? And then we have the state community, not just the city. And then we work with the local council, we look at local governments to be a part of what they are doing on a whole in terms of their community. So it takes various different uh, levels of how we engage with the community. We've worked with many NGOs before, from uh, all the societies of the deaf for the different states. We've worked with Hope Worldwide, which is a, a, a very big partner of ours in some of the food aid programs that we do. Right? Um, we've worked with the different uh, uh, orphanages in different uh, cities and states as well. And so we do it at all fronts, literally at all fronts. But the most important thing is that it gives us, it gives the partners that work for us in our stores, the opportunity to be able to learn and understand and to be able to help. Many times what we see uh, with our customers as well, everybody wants to do good. I talk about CSR at, at that front. Everybody wants to do good. Not many people have the opportunity to do good. Right? Everybody wants to contribute. It's human nature. I want to contribute something. But how can I contribute? Right? So what we try to do is to be able to provide that space where our customers can sign up and contribute. So let's say I give you an example. Right? So if within this community, I mentioned about beach cleanup. So we put up a sign-up sheet. Would you like to join us in cleaning up this beach? The customers was, we have many customers who will sign up. And together with our partners, they will come in and they will join us to do a beach cleanup together. You know? So they, they are not just customers, they are part also of our internal community now, the Starbucks community. You know, so that's how we that's how we uh, that's literally how we do our do our business. Right. Yeah. I, I see that um, you know, by fostering this community, you're engaging uh, not only locally but also statewide, and maybe you can share. Are there any um, significant memories throughout um, part of you being part of this community engagement previously or recently? I think the most significant uh, memory was literally opening our obviously our first signing store. That was that was uh, why that memory is so uh, important was because we were the first country to do it. Um, first country in the world to do it. And when you see that um, come to life, I'll give you an example of things that we've learned, why it's so important, so, why it's still a very strong memory. And I speak about this all the time. You know, one of the things that I never knew existed uh, before we started our first signing store in, in, uh, in uh, KL was the fact that there are actually deaf tours. Deaf tours. Tours. tours? From other countries. I see. Oh, tours, yes. You know, because traditionally, as, as, a, as a deaf person, you cannot join, say if you are coming from Japan to Malaysia, That's right? true. You can't join a normal tour because you can't hear what the tour guide is telling you, right? So they're actually specially tailored tours just for the deaf people. Oh. You were surprised, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is yeah, something new. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was literally uh, something, and how we learned that, right? Because when we opened our first signing store in KL, we get a lot of the deaf tours from other countries like Japan, Korea, even Thailand, who literally, as part of the whole tour program, is to come to this store. Mm. So that they can, the deaf can experience that whole ordering process. Correct. So you're connecting those uh, start with Starbucks being a platform, I think. Correct. You're garnering all these relationships, connections Correct. worldwide by... Yeah. You, by just one signing deaf okay. store. And we never even knew that existed. We didn't even know the tours existed when we started this. So we learned. So that's why it's so significant for us. And I can almost guarantee that in Kuching it will be the same. You will get people from other countries, other tours that will come in and visit the store purely for the fact of experiencing that familiarity if you're deaf. Yes, that's true. And to be able to walk in and communicate. So it's, it is significant as well. Today, when we walk into any Starbucks store and, and we interact with the, with the barista, right? It's so easy because we all speak the same language, right? 
But if you're deaf, there's no interaction. Almost zero interaction. But if you can sign, then it becomes intimate, the conversation between the barista and you. It becomes very intimate. Yeah. No, so that, that's the reason why I say that the, the signing store opening was the mm. most significant. Because it created a big <coughs> opening for us to learn and understand mm. this whole part of, uh, right. of society. So this is a very commendable and remarkable uh, venture, uh, not just for Malaysia, but being the first uh, worldwide. All right. So aside from uh, the DEF uh, program, uh, how does how else does Starbucks articulate its ambition as a global citizen? And what strategies does the company employ to maintain a world-class presence uh, in the various markets around the world? I think if you look at the different countries and if you look at Starbucks, uh, uh, Starbucks Corporation, the core values are very strong in, and, um, and the different countries adopt uh, different programs, you know, um, and, uh, but it's the, found, the foundation and the fundamentals remain the same. It's to be a part of the community that we do business. That fundamentals don't change, irregardless of what country we operate in. We operate Malaysia and Brunei and we practice the, exactly the same thing as the global uh, core value. Obviously, we adapt it locally because it's different. Uh, you know, the perception of customers, the society is different in the different countries. So we adapt it locally. But that core base core values literally don't don't change. Um, to your question, is is actually quite broad to be able to say how do we as a global citizen, right? But I think what we do is um, the different countries do it within their communities. They become local citizens first and then eventually it becomes a global uh, initiative and that literally is how uh, is how we work. Right. Yeah. Right. That's significant as well. I mean, I mean, besides uh, you mentioned to to create this ambition as a global citizen, um, Dato, how about maybe you can elaborate on Starbucks approach to fostering a strong operator to customer relationship, especially in providing the best products as we know when we step into a Starbucks store the products are the key of what the customers are seeking for so maybe you can elaborate further on that okay uh, I'll, I'll break this in two parts again right so if you, if you talk about the customer experience in our stores there are two parts to it that are very important number one is the service yeah number two is the product rightly so as you mentioned the first one that I will I will speak about is the service the first thing you notice is on any cup we write your name yeah right so that makes it very personal. Second thing is that when you walk in, you will be greeted. You will be uh, taken care of as a customer. And in a lot of instances, more than a customer, a friend. If you come to that Starbucks often enough, mm. right? So a lot of people, a lot of our customers uh, say, even here, the thing that they will say is my Starbucks. And that's the thing that we are the most proud about is that when people say this is my Starbucks. True. Yeah. Agreed. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Right. So there's not many businesses that as you walk in as a customer and say that this is my. Mine. You know? mm. So that is our aspiration to be able to build that uh, feeling with our customers. So service is still very important because you will, you are able to forgive products that may not be up to standard once or twice. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, if you order something today, I order my mi goreng today, just say. Mm -hmm. And it's not hot enough, not spicy to my liking. Or something is off with it. And I go to this shop very often, I may be able to forgive, forgive that and say, never mind, I'll come back the next time and try. Lah. Maybe, you know, today the cook not very happy. <laughs> right? Forgiven. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> right, so I, I will come back the next time. And tomorrow you'll forget about it. But if you get bad service, I can almost guarantee that you will remember it for a long time. And you will tell a lot of people about it as mm. well. Even if the food is great, right? Yes. Mm. Because service comes from here. Right. Right? Mm. So, so that to us is very important. So we make sure that every customer is treated as a friend first before a customer. That's why we write your name and we know your name. You know, so if you are regular enough, before you even step through the door, in, in a lot of stores that we have, before you step through the door, your drink is already waiting. 
Because they see you coming, they know what to do already. <laughs> now, so the service is very critical. Second thing to your point on quality, yes, obviously. Because a lot of times you are paying for the quality that, that you get. And in the Starbucks system, our quality is very important. All our beans are roasted centrally. In roasteries around the world. And they are shipped out to, to the different countries. So consistency, it will always be there. Consistency will always be there. A lot of our food suppliers are local food suppliers, so we are able to provide uh, businesses for the local communities that we have, local food suppliers that we do. But the stringentness of our quality is, is very, is very uh, critical. We have got uh, QA standards that are very high that our suppliers will need to meet. And uh, all our baristas are trained to ensure that every single cup you get. So you cannot have just one part where everything is good in terms of quality, but the finished product is not done properly. Right? So that part is also very critical for us. So all our baristas are all trained to be able to uh, not only connect and give the service, but to be able to make the best latte for you. And hopefully with a nice heart when you come in. Yeah. Usually. But, yeah, with a nice heart. <laughs> but I would say the most important part of being a barista is, you know, knowing how to talk to people, uh, having a, a people first mentality. Is that right. is that right? Yes. And um, it is um, not easy to do that because traditionally, um, Malaysians, uh, maybe maybe Asians in general, but I would say Malaysians are generally very reserved. We are not like the Westerners who are literally very vocal. Yes. A lot of uh, Malaysians are actually very reserved. But we have training programs in place to make you feel more comfortable as you speak. Customer. It's never our tradition to walk on the street and say hi to everybody. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Even right? for myself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but if you go to go to the if you were to a Western country, right? They greet everybody. The minute they look at you, they greet you. In anybody for that matter. If you go to the to the US or if you go to Europe, uh, more in the US, they greet everybody. But over here, if somebody greets you out of the blue, you think, oh, this something must be not right. <laughs> right? Socially, so, yes, yeah, when, so when you pointed out. That culture is very important for, for us to be able to build. And that comes with confidence. To lot. Because we hire people across the across, uh, board. We hire people who, are, who live in cities. We hire people who live in villages. We hire people who have never really even drank coffee before. Let alone speak to customers. We hire a lot of young graduates. You know, we hire a lot of single mothers. We hire a lot of, of the different communities. You know, so it's, it's very important for us in that initial training. We spend before, before a barista actually sees his first customer, the barista is with us for three weeks on training only. Three weeks? Only. Before, it, before the person even sees his first customer. You know, so that part is, is literally what we do. Right. That's a strenuous training, Francis. Yeah, like especially now. No? Yeah, especially <laughs> now with the deaf community also being included inside the yes. Starbucks uh, program. So, right. Cheryl, I guess uh, that would be uh, our segment for for now. Uh, we'll be back on TVS Dialogue with more questions for the head of Starbucks Malaysia. Be right back. And we are back with TVS Dialogue. Once more, joining us today, where Radzi and I is Dr. Sydney Keys. Again, thank you so much for being here until we're almost to the end of the segment. Dato, thank you so much for your time. And uh, previously, right, Razi, we've we heard the sharings and the stories from Dato Sydney also on uh, fostering customer operator relationships. And then he also delved down into the products as well as the community that he is fostering uh, as part of Starbucks uh, as being a brand. Now, for the third segment, uh, Dato, we would also like to dive further into the demand itself since we mentioned on products. Uh, so, with the growing demand of coffee in Malaysia or even Sarawak, I'm pretty sure there are a number of emerging brands seeking for the similar potential uh, as well. So, would you say competitions towards Starbucks? I mean, what is the way you would look at this in a business perspective? I think in I think in uh, I think in any business competition is healthy. 
I think competition provides a choice for the consumer. Mm. And uh, overall, competition is a good thing. Um, we see a lot of, um, uh, as you mentioned, rightly so, emerging uh, coffee players. Uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, coffee players that are, that are that <coughs> tend to copy us too much. Mm. Uh, we see that happening. Uh, I guess it's natural yep. yeah. that you would follow the the leading, the leading. Uh, uh, the coffee uh, yeah. player. I guess Starbucks can be uh, similar to iPhone and then the rest. Exactly, yeah. mm-hmm. exactly. So, but again, um, the most important thing in this business is obviously sustainability. Mm-hmm. You know, in any uh, in the FMB business, uh, we've seen many trends. There are many trends. If you see, um, uh, and I say this in general, right? Uh, we at one stage had the bubble tea trend. The trendsetter. Yeah. Of- so we had <laughs> bubble tea as a trend. Everybody mm. wanted to do the bubble tea business. But again, there were very few that could sustain it, their business. Now, so um, if you ask my opinion in terms of competition, I think, I think there's space for everybody. Um, I think the, the buying community in Malaysia is big enough. Uh, space for everybody um, and I think um, the, you just need to build your niche and find the position where you are good at and eventually build it from there. Uh, we, we see a lot of um, individuals who love to set up their own. They are very passionate about coffee, they are very passionate about the business. My, my take on that uh, is continue doing what you're doing because if you really like what you're doing, then literally it's not a job. You know, and a lot of these individuals are like that. So, for us, competition in general is a good thing. Um, we welcome, we definitely welcome competition. Um, and you know, in and if you want to use us as a role model, by all means, you know, I we to us, I think that's really very natural. Yeah, mm, that's true. Competition is really a very good thing. Uh, yes. Good thing because without competition. Uh, business could get complacent. Exactly, uh, yeah. it doesn't mm. help you to improve as well. Mm. You know, so I think it, it, it's really a complement to right. to each other. That's uh, true. Healthy mm. competition Healthy is competition. vital yes. to mm. yes. right? I believe yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so Dato, um, in Starbucks for its third quarter ending March thirty first, twenty twenty three, uh, Berjaya Food uh, net profit dropped to. Uh, 15.94 million from 31.58 million in the previous corresponding uh, quarter. Uh, revenue, meanwhile, grew to 265.85 million from 246 million uh, earlier. And in fiscal year 23, fiscal year 24, and fiscal year 25, earnings estimates are uh, cut you know, by 29%, 30%, and 28%, respectively, after. Uh, adjusting for lower earnings before uh, interest and tax margin. So revenue is growing, but profit is shrinking. Yeah, and Dato, this is attributed to Starbucks, I think, having to purchase uh, earlier in a case study that around 60% of its raw materials from Starbucks International due to this uh, tax uh, incentives and reductions. And... um, as they hedged its raw material components, mm. I mean, for a two-year period during the onset of a mm. pandemic, I think you can clearly remember that. Yeah, yeah. And with the inflationary environment and rising cost pressures, I think this definitely had an adverse effect on Starbucks. But Starbucks also has come out stronger through the disruptions of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, under your leadership. So how would you uh, say, or how, what would you comment on this approach on this challenging outlook that most of us or most business owners would have as well? I think the first thing is in, in uh, if you look at our results in totality, um, we're actually doing better than uh, uh, pre-COVID, you know? And um, last year was literally, an, uh, so if you look at the, the profits, right? Um, last year was, uh, the year in comparison, I mean, was actually an exceptional year for the overall business in Malaysia. Um, that was when everybody was out traveling. Everybody wanted to, uh, and that was where it was a lot freer to travel because at that, at that stage, that was in uh, the time when a lot of people were more relaxed. Right after COVID, you know, right after COVID, people were still very hesitant to travel. Everybody was still very uh, conservative. They went around, were still wearing masks, you know, and everybody was still afraid. But that year, the, the corresponding, the, the previous year, 
um, that previous quarter and that whole financial year, um, people were more, people started to go out more and uh, people were even traveling more, but local travel, a lot of the local, local. So they were spending money in country and that's the reason why our, at, at during that time, we saw very strong results, extremely strong. Our results are very strong on its own as, as a company, you know. Uh, um, we do a net profit, uh, our, we just closed our financial year and net profit is over 100 million ringgit. So, you know, we are very strong as a company, but obviously versus the previous, uh, quart the previous year's quarter, we, we, because people are spending a lot of money in country. Today, people are flying out. I'm sure you know many friends who are traveling overseas. And we are able to justify that as well because we see that happening very strongly. Uh, we see that sales trend happening very strongly in our airport stores. We have stores in all airports in Malaysia. And we see our airport stores significantly increasing in, uh, in sales because a lot of people are literally traveling out. So a lot of people who used to spend money in country or just move around in, are today traveling abroad. You know, so obviously that to me is what we are seeing today is very natural. It's very natural for, for people to be able to start traveling. So that is one. Secondly, on your on your point of um, uh, cost pressure or margin shrinkage, I think there are many factors to that. I think uh, one of the most important thing is obviously uh, cost has gone up. Definitely, I mean, you know, it, it's all over the different industries. Costs have, have definitely gone up. Um, our ringgit against the US dollar today is not at its strongest as well. So all of these components affect the business to a certain degree. But what we do, uh, or what, or how we have mitigated is, if you look at all the analyst report today, you will see that everybody says that uh, the trajectory for Bijaya food is on an uptrend. Most of the analysts will quote a buy call because they understand that uh, the worst is over in that sense, in terms of the cost and everything else. You know, so for us, what we do internally to, to mitigate that is obviously we take care of our costs very well. The stores manage their costs very well because we have a whole cost management structure for them. When I say cost, uh, there are different costs in the F&B business. Number one, obviously, is food costs. One of the biggest costs is food costs. So we manage food costs. We don't waste too much. We don't over pour, don't over spill. So all this, I mean, these are all very technical. But these are things that we do to mitigate costs so that the last thing we want to do is to be able to translate that cost increase to the customer. And how you translate the cost increase to the customer is by increasing your price. And we don't want to do that. And we will not do that. But what we will do is manage it internally. Number one, obviously, like I said, is food costs. Number two is labor in, in this business. So labor is another very big cost. So we manage that accordingly. You know, in terms of uh, in terms of how we schedule people, we don't have too many people to serve too little customers. You know, these are all very very uh, basics for for our industry. Third thing is utilities. Utilities are also a very big cost. Electricity, water is also a big cost, right? So those things are we also manage. I mentioned you know part of our uh, sustainability we have solar panels in our store, so that helps us with our utilities as well. So when we get all of this right, which we are constantly doing very well, then we are able to mitigate the costs that or the pressures that are brought to us on the macro front. We can't control the ringgit. If the ringgit continues to slide, nothing we can do as, as a business to prevent that. But we'll have to manage accordingly and to be able to, I think most businesses are like that, to be able to be nimble enough to manage accordingly. If global cost goes up, Say, for example, any uh, commodity or non-commodity item and it affects our business, like you mentioned, 60% of the things that we buy are exposed to the to Forex, then we'll have to manage that accordingly as well. You know, so that's literally how. But the last thing that we want to do, and I say this again, the last thing that we want to do is be able to translate that cost increase to the customer. There's only one way you can do that, and that is to increase your price. Increase the mm. price, yes. And that's not, not what right. we not what we wanted. So it's a very delicate juggling of, of costs and yes. yeah. Yes. yes. Mm. But uh, how maybe maybe you could share also um Dato, to the you have the you of course the customers are your 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 front 
line of the brand to not increase um, the cost would affect you know all the other labor costs utilities i mean being reduced or or how do you mitigate that matter in a way could you translate maybe um, to our viewers what is the best general strategy that business owners who also have the same or similar situation as uh, as starbucks or on the same situation as well how how would you say if you look at the if you look at starbucks for example it may be a little bit different from uh, different different um, establishments because of the size that we are at right so if you for example if you save one ringgit you're saving a lot of money because of the sheer size that that the business is so um, i think my advice would be to really look at the business as well what we do here is really look at the business as a whole to be able to understand the different components of the business and then to be able to manage what the components that you believe can do better. So it could be through efficiency. To be able to massage that part and spread out the cost to a certain degree. Uh, uh, so we look, we look at it in that, we literally look at it in that manner. That's how we look at it. So we look at the different components. Which are the components that uh, we believe that productivity can go up. Efficiency can be better. You know? And, and then we, we work around that. So we've got many, we've got, um, if you look at our, our office, we've got many action plans going on simultaneously at one time for the, all the different components of, of our business. And with the sole goal of being able to still deliver the world-class service that we have and not to be able to translate any of that cost down. That's remarkable, Hansi. Yeah. And I must amazing. mention one more thing. When you mentioned about COVID, right? Mm. Um, when we went through that whole COVID scenario everybody was li literally for the first six months nobody knew what to do for the this first, was the first time that yes hit. it's nothing that anyone could anticipate as exactly, well exactly <laughs> exactly but one of the thing one of the key things that i'm very proud about is that during that period of time even until today we never laid off anybody wow. oh, we never did that's really surprising our stores were not open some were open for delivery only but not for the first three months because there was no delivery at that time as well everything Correct. was in lockdown mm. then slowly things started to open right to a stage we were considered as essentials because it's part of the uh, food and beverage, food and beverage yes, business. industry no but the thing that we are most proud about is during that period of time we did not lay off anybody that's amazing everybody that was there are still there are still here today your employees must owe it a lot to you yeah. <laughs> for that but, but that that cost a heavy cost on us as well Right, but then it's also like you said, you know. So we don't sacrifice too much just to mitigate costs. No, there are certain things that morally we need to be able to do to ensure that we also take care of the people that have worked with us for for a while. Yeah. So that that uh, that's a very uh, insightful uh, uh, peer into the inner workings of Starbucks during, especially during the COVID nineteen pandemic. So I wanna. Uh, we are nearing the end of our show. Uh, we would love to have more time uh, to, talk, to have a conversation with you. But um, for our final few questions, where do you envis uh, envision Starbucks Malaysia in the next few years? Uh, are there any specific goals or milestones that the company is aiming to achieve? Generally, so, yeah. like, what's next for Starbucks? <laughs> I think the first thing is how it affects uh, uh, Sarawak and Kuching. I, I speak on that first. I think what uh, we want, we intend to do, hopefully, is to be able to bring our reserve store concept to Kuching. I think you know that our reserve store is the is the Starbucks, so we are very intimate with with our customers. We have different brewing methods. It's very different from a store like this. That's the store with the R, so that's reserve. It's a, it's a higher end uh, store that we have, and we have two bars there. So, in short, we want to bring the reserve store here. So that is for Kuching. The other thing is that I think looking at the company on the whole, obviously our expansion plans are very strong. Uh, we are very focused on growth as a company. Um, we are looking at areas of opportunity in, in terms of growth. Um, this coming financial year, we hope to be able to open about 48 stores, between 48 to 50 new stores uh, in, in Malaysia. Um, so we see it as a very positive, uh, uh, we see the growth of the country as well as uh, our own growth as very positive as we move as we move forward um, and what can you expect from Starbucks you can expect 
to have the same Starbucks experience that you have today in the next two years. Like I said, we're opening our 400 uh, store next month. Actually, in October, we're opening our 400 store. We hope by the time in the next two years, we'll probably be opening our 500 or more store. You know, so basically that is the trend. So it's always been, the growth will always be positive. We will continue to, uh, uh, we have a, a full local workforce. I don't have any foreigners in my system. So we have a full local workforce. And like I said, we employ just for Starbucks alone, close to what, 6,000 people or more. Uh, and we hope to be able to provide that same employment for Malaysians as, as we go along as well. So, you know, in short, we see everything as being very positive in terms of uh, growth, in terms of, of uh, how we see the business outlook over the next two years. Yeah. Well, Dato, that has been a very insightful conversation uh, as we dived into the journey, the values, and what Starbucks means not just to the community, but also uh, from the perspective of its leaders, uh, the backbone and the driving force in achieving its benchmark since 1998 with the first Starbucks in Malaysia. Right. Yes, yeah. Radzi. And also what we can glean from this conversation also <coughs> that, uh, is that to make a very successful franchise, a brand as big as Starbucks, I think you need a lot of, um, you need a lot of um, consideration in its people, its experience and of course the community and engaging in everyone all around as well. And also creating the culture is something that I find very satisfying in Starbucks as well. And uh, of course, last and not least, a very great love of coffee. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so, Dr. Dato, it's been a very uh, yes, long and insightful. Thank you for having me, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your, so time, much for your time, yes. thank you. Um, It's been a very long and uh, insightful conversation, very valuable. And our thoughts are quite harsh, so let's say we sure. have a drink. <laughs> sure, sure. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. Yes. <laughs> so, with that, I am uh, Radhi Ahmad. And I'm Shao Chameto. Signing off from TBS Dialogue.